right, week number four in five Sola series. I don't know uh, in here if you've been here the past three weeks, then this is going to totally make sense. But let me catch the others up just in case you missed uh, one or all of those. Uh, five solas, if you're like me, you would have looked at that and said, what is a sola? Not, you know, but a sola, so the word sola is actually Latin for the word alone. And uh, 500 years ago, this guy named Martin Luther um, began, started, sparked what uh, later would be called the Protestant Reformation. Uh, religion had become corrupt. You think it's corrupt now. Man, religion was much more corrupt even then. And Martin Luther just really called them out, man. He nailed 95 reasons or protest uh, against the church. And uh, it, w- it was a monumental moment in the life of, really, Christianity as a whole. And, uh, and so everything we enjoy today, even from just a, a, the purity of the truth of God's Word, we owe in large part to the boldness of a man named Martin Luther who was willing to kind of just take a stand. And so these five solas or the five alones, are kind of foundational, five foundational doctrines of that Protestant Reformation. We've been kind of walking through those five these last five weeks uh, just as kind of a, a, to, to remember um, the, uh, the Protestant Reformation. But I tell you what, it's been rich, man. I've really, I've really enjoyed uh, diving into these uh, ideas and the Scripture that supports them. And, uh, and if you remember back about uh, four weeks ago, we started with faith. We talked about the fact that there's no way that anybody can be saved without faith. It's faith alone. Um, And then we went forward into this idea of Scripture and uh, sola scriptura. Uh, Scripture alone is is the authority by which we live and even gain knowledge of how to be saved. If it weren't for Scripture, we wouldn't even know that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. So understanding that, while it's an event in the history of mankind that we do trust in, that is Jesus Christ's death on the cross... Forgiveness of our sins is so dependent on our acknowledgement that Jesus died for us. And we repent from our sins, we turn to Jesus to be saved. That's all true, but without knowledge of Scripture, we wouldn't even know that happened. And so, man, it's so important to remember Scripture alone is the authority and source of our faith. But then we went last week into Christ alone and talked about the significance of Jesus. Jesus being the only hope we had. Jesus wasn't plan B. He wasn't even like one of many options. He was the only option. He was the only hope that we had for salvation in the midst of our sin and corruption. And just in case you're a guest and maybe you're like, man, I don't know what to expect here. You know, I've not not, never been to the church or whatever. I just say, man, we're a church full of people who are sinners, all right? Nobody in this room is, is perfect. Go and look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you, man, all right? Yeah, go ahead and tell him. Yeah, you're not perfect, all right? And if you think you're perfect, then I'm going to go and tell you, you're probably going to really not like hearing God's Word because the Word of God tells us continually that we haven't arrived. This whole religious junk you get a lot of places when you go somewhere and you feel like everybody's just walking around and they're self-righteous and they've already arrived and they're looking down their noses at everybody else because they're not what they should be. Here's what I'd say. Those people, honestly, are just oblivious to the fact that they don't deserve Jesus either. They don't deserve Him. And, and at the end of the day, this, this message, this word, grace, is what just reminds us of that continually. That if it was not for grace, none of us would even be breathing today. This is fitting that it's the week of Thanksgiving. You know, we're, we're going to be celebrating. We're going to be stuffing our faces uh, Thursday and, and watching football and stuff like that. But here's what, I, we don't need to get lost in all that stuff and miss truly thank, Thanksgiving. You know, we're thankful. Man, we're thankful for who God is. We're thankful for what God has given to us. But man, we're thankful for the grace that he's shown us because without grace, we wouldn't even live and breathe. Without grace, we wouldn't be able to function. Without grace, we wouldn't even be able to walk. (laughs) Without grace, we definitely would not have hope for eternity with Jesus in heaven. So man, it's all about grace. This Christian life is not about you being a good person. It's about you surrendering your life to a perfect person, Jesus Christ. And after you surrender your life to him, man, he then empowers you by his grace to live the life that he's called you to live. So go ahead and turn in or turn on your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, fifth chapter in the book of Romans. And Paul, as he's writing this letter to the church at Rome, is just really going to make it clear that, man, salvation has nothing to do with you in the sense that, man, you didn't earn it, you didn't, you didn't do anything to deserve it, 
But, but Jesus truly saved us in spite of ourselves. The word grace even means, the definition of the word grace means unmerited favor. This is favor shown by God to us that was not deserved. That's what grace is, and we have all been recipients of that grace. You may say, well, preacher, I'm not even a follower of Jesus right now. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a Christian right now. And I'd say, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, the fact that you're in this room today hearing this word preached, I'm just telling you, man, that's grace. That is God giving you grace. You may say, how do you figure that? It's God giving you grace and giving you an opportunity to embrace the gospel. So all of us are recipients of grace at some level. So as we walk through Romans 5.1, it should be on the screen behind me, just kind of open your heart to, God, speak to me. God, and maybe you're here and you're kind of skeptical. I'd say, God, if you're up there, talk. You know, speak to me. Maybe I won't hear your voice, but, but in my heart, let me know that what I'm hearing is right. And I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit will really do that. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2, so important. Through whom, speaking of Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Man, it gets so confusing when we talk about faith and grace. In fact, sometimes we hear Ephesians 2, 8 where it says, uh, by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourself is a gift of God. And we're like, well, what's the difference then between grace and faith? And I would say this verse 2 in Romans 5 really spells it out. Because because of Jesus, it's, between, it's through whom, him, that we have gained access by faith. Faith has brought us to this place where we stand in the grace of God. And we boast in the hope, the future hope of the glory of God. Look at verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. I want you to see that it's crazy, but Paul is saying in verse 3 that we glory in suffering. We actually can find God's glory and we can glorify Him even in the midst of suffering. And so it says that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And then look at verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Man, this morning, as we talk about grace, I want us to just really think about three things in particular. The first thing I want us to see is that we stand in His grace. The passage is clear. Verse 2 kind of spells this out. But it's telling us that we actually stand in His grace. It's in His grace we now stand. And in this explanation of kind of a contrast between faith and grace, you're going to have to really lean in and grab it because I'm telling you, it's not easy for this brain to figure it out. You guys are probably a lot sharper than me. But when you talk about faith, I want you to think of faith as like a pathway, all right? Think of faith for just a moment as like a, like a pathway or, or a direction that you're walking. And grace is the destination that you end up in. All right? And I want to read these passages to you again. Verse 2 says, Through Jesus Christ we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. This destination. Ephesians 2 eight. By grace you've been saved through faith. Again, so grace is the destination Faith is the direction or the, the process or the pathway by which we found the grace of God. So we walk through a pathway of faith into this new life of grace. You could say it like this. Faith is the vehicle, all right? Faith is the direction that we're walking, this pathway uh, that we're walking in which we arrive in the destination of God's grace. And, and so... Uh, it, it's so important to grab a hold of. If I were to, uh, let's say we could pick materialism or, or money or relationships, man, you know, family. All these are pathways. And there are times in our life to where we have really, we've really invested our faith in those things. All right, and I, I don't, let's not get too spiritual here, all right? I know some people say, oh, preacher, I've never trusted money. I've just knew that all my life, never. Oh, please, you know, when it's bill time, and your bank's empty, you know, you, you definitely, you start going, oh man, I really need money. Most of the time, that's our immediate thought process, is we think that we have, we've all erred on the side of placing our faith in, in money. We've placed our faith in materialism. If I just had that, I would be happy. Man, if I could just, if I could just do this or do that. If I had this position, you know, this, if I had this reputation, if I had this, this job, 
that I'd really be happy. He says, place your faith in that thing. Family relationships, or maybe relationships outside the family. And we place our faith. It's not that we shouldn't have good relationships, but understand that if we place our faith in those relationships, then what we're doing is we're saying that's the pathway that we're looking for, for grace in. And here's the deal. We're not going to find it there. In fact, I could, I could even say it like this. I think, I'm, I'm not sure if I said this in here a couple weeks ago, but I've referred to this monitor. It's got a lot of credit lately. I could, I could have faith in this monitor. And I could say, man, I really trust that this monitor can save me. But the truth of the matter is that's a speaker, man. The speaker cannot save me. I could have all kinds of faith in it. I, mean, I, could, I could trust this thing. I could lay down and worship it. I could, I could throw my money at it, right? And nothing I do is going to make that monitor able to save me. If I place my faith in something, an object that doesn't have the ability to save me, then it doesn't matter how sincere I am. I'm lost. I'm hopeless. And so the object of my faith matters. There are a whole lot of pathways of faith. And so it's not just by faith only in the sense of faith in any kind. Faith of any kind in anything saves us. No, that's crazy. That, that makes no reasonable sense. No, the object of my faith matters more often than even the level of my faith. We know the Bible says if we have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, I mean, we can move mountains. So, so the size of my faith matters less than the object of my faith. I'm not trusting that speaker. I'm trusting Jesus Christ. But if I'm walking through a pathway of faith that Jesus has, I have faith in Jesus, it's going to lead me to a destination of grace. I'll never forget standing on the shore of Kotzebue, Alaska. It was the shore of uh, the Arctic Ocean. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but I've, I did the Arctic plunge. Amy chickened out. She refused to get in the Arctic Ocean. It was, it was July, but I'm going to tell you, it was cold, brother. Let me, woo, I'm telling you. You, get, I mean, you jump in there and you're, wow, you know. So I, I, I took the Arctic plunge like an idiot, and I, got, you know, I went swimming and in the Arctic Ocean, froze to death and, and all that. But, but I remember standing in Kotzebue, Alaska. Kotzebue is a place you can't get easily. You know, there's no good way of getting there, really. There's no road. This is straight up. No road that goes to Kotzebue. No road that goes to Kotzebue. you got to either take a boat or fly in. And for us, a boat, Georgia, you can't take a boat there, right? So we had to get on a plane. It was the only means by which we would stand in Kotzebue. Some people are like, I don't get on planes. Well, you wouldn't go to Kotzebue then, all right? It's just you're not going to do it. So it was the only means by which, the only pathway by which I was going to be able to later stand in the destination Kotzebue, Alaska. Uh, Kotzebue is a beautiful place, but take the next slide, it turns like this in winter. Boom! Wow. Cold, brother. Let me tell you, all right? You think it's cold here? Ouch! That's cold, all right? But then the next picture is a picture of the runway that we landed on. Yeah. Wow, right? You should have been in the plane with me and Amy because here, and Amy was actually six months old. Amy went with us to Kotzebue. But as we were on this, uh, by the way, plane ride with a six-month-old, not a good idea. All right, I'm just going to tell you that side note, all right? But as we're landing, um, nobody had shared with me, hey, man, this, this runway looks like this. Nobody showed me a picture. I had no idea. So when we're, I mean, they're like, uh, we're descending. We're getting ready to land in Kotzebue. It's been a beautiful day out there, you know, whatever they'd say. They're not. So I start looking out the window. Isn't that what you do? So I, I start looking out the window. Guess what I see? The Arctic Ocean. That's all I see, all right? That's it. So I'm thinking, okay, we're, we're I'm literally getting close to the ground or water, and I'm looking out. There's nothing but water. Look out on the other side. Guess what? Water. No, why? That's crazy, right? Well, you literally fly in, and, and but you don't see land until the plane touches down, brother. It was crazy. But it just I thought back to that story or that experience for me and Amy when I thought about faith and grace because... We think sometimes that, you know, it's hard to grasp what faith and grace is, but, but if, if the plane is faith, Kotzebue is grace. And, and it's by the plane I got to Kotzebue. It's by faith in Jesus Christ that I stand in the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, some people would say, well, wait a minute, that means it starts with us. And, I mean, people want to get in a doctrinal debate about that a lot of times and say, if, if that's the case, then we somehow earn our salvation if it's based on my faith. And so if, my, if, I, if, if I had to initiate by faith, then that means somehow I saved myself. And, and that is, again, ludicrous in the sense that the object of faith is what ultimately matters, not the amount of faith I have. 
So my faith doesn't save me. I hope we got, man, this is so important. My faith doesn't save me. It is when I place my faith in Jesus, right? When I actually determine that Jesus is the one in whom I'm willing to desert everything else. I mean, I'm willing to totally abandon every hope that I have in any other pathway. Jesus is it. And so I'm going to go through the pathway of faith to get to this destination of salvation that doesn't depend on me. So it's not about me being a good enough person. It's about me finding a good enough Jesus, right? Jesus is enough. And so his grace saves me. And then here's the thing, though. Then we don't just then we don't just like celebrate eternal life forever. We celebrate the abundant life he's given us now. You may say, well, what are you talking about? Here's the deal. See, this grace that saves us eternally also gives us power to live a life now that's pleasing to God. And so we stand in his grace. You may say, well, preacher, I like the whole grace saves us for eternity. But I don't know what you're talking about, about standing in his grace today. I'm just saying, wherever you go to lunch, you just remember this, all right? If you go to Zaxby's and you don't cuss somebody out, that's the grace of God. Amen? I'm just telling you. Don't look so spiritual. You know what I'm talking about, right? You've been there, yeah. You can put any McDonald's, all right? Let's not pick on Zaxby's. Let's not pick on chicken. Let's throw to McDonald's. Yeah. Wherever, look, there, have you ever driven during Christmas time on Woodruff Road? Grace. Grace. What are you talking about, preacher? That's the only thing that delivered you from hand gestures. Amen? I'm telling you. The grace of God. The grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd have to take your magnet or your sticker off the back of your car because people are like, oh, they go to First Baptist Church. Do not cuss somebody out with a sticker on the back of your car, all right? (laughs) Serious business. If you got a shirt that says says the logo or whatever, man, put your hand on your logo or something, you know? Don't don't be giving Jesus a bad name. But that, that, see, that's, you need grace. You need grace to stand, brother. You don't think you need grace. Without grace, you wouldn't have that wife. That's, that's right, preacher. I wasn't going to say it loud, but amen, amen. That's right. Hey, without grace, you couldn't raise those kids. Y'all should have said amen about the wife thing, too, in a minute ago. I'm just telling you. Uh, without grace, you couldn't live with those parents. Now, but watch, watch it. Watch it. <laughs> but it's true, you know. I'm just telling you, we live around a bunch of sinners, I'm telling you, we do life with imperfect people. We are surrounded by people who need Jesus, not just for eternity. You need Jesus for Monday. (laughs) Yes. And coffee. Jesus and coffee are the two things you need on Monday. But you need it without Jesus, without the grace of God. Man, you're going to lose every friend you got. Because you need the filter of grace. Man, without the grace of God, you're going you're gonna to lose every, every spouse of your spouse. Every spouse. You're going to lose every one of them, brother. <laughs> All them wives you got, I'm telling you. I didn't know this was a Mormon church. I didn't know that. I <laughs> had no idea. thought this was Baptist. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's ADD coming out of me. Anyway, the truth of the matter is, we need grace, man. We need grace to preach a sermon on Sunday morning. Amen. It's the truth. We need grace. No matter who we are, sometimes we get so super spiritual and we think we've arrived that we forget how hopelessly, desperately lost we are without the grace of God. Man, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing without Jesus. I'm nothing without Jesus. There's nothing in me worth hearing if it's not for the grace of God that gives me the ability to preach. Nothing. Zero. Nothing. There's nothing worth saving if it weren't for the grace of God. Look, God has poured out his grace on us. Even making us in his likeness is a gift of his grace. The breath that we breathe, the ability to wake up in the morning is the grace of God. Man, I'm hoping that God opens my eyes on Thanksgiving Day so that Thursday when I'm eating this turkey <laughs> and ham and stuff, oh, I'm getting hungry now. But yeah, when, I'm, when I'm doing all this other stuff that we always do on Thanksgiving, don't lose sight of, of the grace of God. We are so thankful That God has given us His grace. He has blessed us. We stand in His grace. But you know, we don't just stand in His grace. Man, sometimes we're not standing. It's easier to stand in His grace than to suffer by His grace. You see, suffering's a real part of life. 
we have bad days, but man, it's worse than that. Sometimes we have bad years. Sometimes you're suffering. Sometimes everybody turns against you. Sometimes your health is bad. Sometimes your job is lost. Sometimes your account is empty. And see, it's easy to go down the pathway of faith when everything's sunny. But man, when the winter comes, bro, it's not as easy. It's hard to go down that pathway of faith in Jesus Christ. When your bank account's empty, what happens is we want to shift gears. We want to go down a different pathway and start depending on money. And see, when, when relationships are broken and, and when people desert you and you feel like nobody loves you, nobody cares about you, what happens is we start getting insecure. And instead of leaning on Jesus by his grace, what we start doing is we start going down a pathway of, of insecurity and trying to depend on other people. And, and we need other people more than we need Jesus. See, we've got to remember, we're going down this pathway of faith that takes us to a destination of grace. And as we stand in His grace, even if our circumstances are terrible, man, we can keep standing because it's by the grace of God we're in those circumstances. And here's the deal. We're not trusting our, our present circumstances. We're trusting in our future hope. And see, that's what this passage really says. Let me walk through three things found in, in verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says in Romans 5, 3, We glory in sufferings... Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, character, and hope. Perseverance, character, and hope. Would you say those three things? Perseverance, character, and hope. First, our response to suffering is to press on, right? We're not going to quit. Just because things get difficult, just because suffering comes, we're not going to quit. I'm gonna, we got to respond by persevering, pressing on. Refusing to quit. What's that? It's perseverance right there in the passage in verse 3. But then second, our identity in suffering is maintained in our testimony. You may say, what are you talking about? We're talking about character. You don't just never quit. You never change. So as you press on, as you persevere, you're going to be the same man in the midst of suffering that you were in celebration. You're going to be the same woman in the midst of trial and tribulation as you were in triumph. See, that's really what being a child of God should be about, is we're not just going to celebrate on the mountaintop, we're going to celebrate in the valley. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have grace by the grace of God. I know that I have eternity with Jesus, but you know what? That's, that's one day. Here's, i got abundant life now. Jesus saved me for today, not just tomorrow. And so I'm not going to live less of a life today. I'm not going to let these circumstances define me. Because if I'm defined by the circumstances, then I am defeated. I am lost. I am loser. I am, I am jobless. I am orphan. You see, those, those are the things that the world throws at us that wants to define us. But here's what Jesus is saying. By the grace of God, he speaks into us his character, his righteousness. And so we see that when we stand before the Father, it will be Jesus that he sees, not us. And so our identity in suffering, difficulty, struggle, trial... It's maintained in our testimony, this character. But then we look on further in verse 3 and we see uh, our hope. You see, our confidence in suffering isn't based on our current circumstances, but our future hope. It's not just based on today, it's based on tomorrow. And see, sometimes we get lost in this and we say, well, man, I, I'm telling you, I don't even see hope in tomorrow because of my current circumstances. Preacher, don't you know I'm broke, man? Preacher, don't you know, my, I have nobody. I have nobody. My family's left me. Everybody turned against me. Don't you know, man, my, my job, I lost my job. I ain't got any way to take care of my... Look, if we think about our circumstances and we're looking around us, then we have no confidence if our faith is in our circumstances. And so when we get to that moment of hopelessness, we need to remind ourselves, I messed up and somehow I've placed my faith in this stuff. I place my faith in money. I place my faith in materialism. I place my faith in relationships. Somehow I've messed up. I didn't mean to because I know God saved me. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. So I know I place my faith in him. I know I stand in eternity in the grace of God. But I don't just want to stand in eternity in the grace of God. I want to stand today in the grace of God. I want to stand in this moment, in this crisis, in this circumstance. I want to stand in the grace of God. Man, you know that First Baptist Church there in Texas where all that tragedy happened two weeks ago? You may tell you the only thing, man, the only thing that can cause that daddy who's the pastor of that First Baptist Church to stand there and, and still give glory to God as his daughter lost her life to the hand of that gunman. 
That is not a good man. That is a man who surrendered his life to Jesus. That is a woman. That wife, that mama, is a mama who actually believes what they've been saying for all those years. Their circumstances, loss of the life of their daughter. Are you kidding me? Their circumstances don't define their hope. Their hope is not based on the the circumstances of today, but the hope of tomorrow. Knowing that Jesus is not going to let them down. See, when we get lost in the circumstances, it's because we've placed our faith in the wrong thing. People who have it right get it. And so today I I really do pray and, and I challenge you guys to place your faith in Jesus. Take the pathway through his faith so it takes you to the destination of his grace. So that when bad things happen, man, you're not giving up. You're not hopeless because you're not depending on the circumstances to save you. You're depending on Jesus Christ and his grace to save you. I want to share with you an old hymn called Solid Rock. First two verses go like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly I completely lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, when the tragedy comes, when the suffering comes, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor, it holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You see, we we may hear that and may have heard that before, but listen, when we trust personality, when we trust profession, pride, popularity, position, or possession, all of those things are are shifting sand. And so if we trust them, then we're going to end up walking through the the pathway of faith in those things, and we're going to stand on sinking sand, not the solid rock. But see, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we stand in His grace, not based on the shifting sands of our circumstances, but based on His grace that is completely sufficient. So we see that we stand in His grace. We endure suffering by His grace. And then thirdly, we are saved by His grace. Now, if you're like me, you wanted to run to that first, right? That's like the first thing we want to talk about is that we've been saved by grace. And it's so true. I mean, our eternal life is so dependent, completely dependent on the grace of God. And there's no doubt absolutely no doubt in my mind that there, in this room today there are multiple people who have never really placed their faith in Jesus. I mean, you've not walked, you're hearing all this and you're like, man, that guy's, he's a simple man. <laughs> he's talking about pathways and destinations and what in the world. And, but you're saying, I've never done that. I mean, I've never walked through the pathway of faith. I've never said, hey, I, I believe Jesus is, is, is the way that I can be saved. He's the Savior. And so I'm going to walk through, I'm going to have faith in him. And I'm going to trust that having faith in him takes me to a destination of standing in his grace. If, you may say, I've never done that. I, I've never been saved by faith and grace, Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't know what that looks like. And I would say, man, this is your opportunity. This is, again, a picture of grace. You have been given grace by God today to embrace salvation, forgiveness of your sins. Not religion, Jesus. We are saved by His grace. I'm going to read verses 6 through 11. Look at verse 6 in Romans 5 again. It says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But listen to verse 8. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Man, Jesus didn't wait on me to get right. Jesus didn't wait on me to get clean. Jesus said, come to me like you are. Even while I was a sinner, Jesus died for me. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, we, if while we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Look at verse 11. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the picture, man. God wants to give you grace. God wants to show you grace. He doesn't want you to have to live this life hoping you're okay in the end. 
like going to Vegas and gambling away your eternity. That is not a picture of what God's done. Look, God has made a way. God has made a pathway. Through his son Jesus Christ, death on the cross, he built a pathway. You've got to have faith in that pathway. If you don't have faith, you're not going to be saved. You've got to have faith in the pathway. And when you go through that pathway, stop depending on your good works. Depend on the grace that you're standing in. And that grace will empower you to do the good works that he's called you to do. The final verse of that hymn says, When he shall come with trumpet sound, hmm, Oh, may I then in him, in him, Oh, then may I in him be found, standing in his grace, dressed in his righteousness, not mine, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. The chorus says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Man, today, you may be here and you may say, Preacher, I, I, I want what you're saying. What you're saying. I, I, want, I want what you're talking about. I, I want to be saved. I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to do. I, there's multiple options. Let me just say real quickly. During this final song, you could come forward. There's ministers who are going to be down here. I'll get you with one, and you can talk with them right now in a private conversation about what it means to be saved. You can be saved today before you leave this place. Or you got a connect card in front of you. That little card, it's truly just to connect to people, connect to a minister. If you just fill out contact information and you say, I want to talk to somebody about salvation. I want to talk to somebody about, about membership, baptism, whatever it is then you do that. This is an opportunity to respond publicly, and then we have more opportunities to respond in other ways. Please embrace the grace of God. Let me pray for you. Lord, God, we love you. You're, you're so good to us. Wow. To say thank you is so insufficient. And I know even this week right before Thanksgiving is such a, 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 an obvious part of what we're thinking right now as we go into this the season of thanks. But God, I pray today we wouldn't lose sight of this, that you have called us to yourself. There, there are people in this room, God, who need to be saved. I know it. You, God, you want to save them. I pray you would just speak to their heart right now. Even in, in the way that only you can, God, confirm in their heart and in their spirit that this is truth. God, draw them to yourself. Speak to them the grace that can save them. Lord, I pray you'd speak to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together?